Hey, it's Nathan, and today I wanted to go ahead and talk about a paradoxical math thing that occurs in measure theory when you start thinking about the axiom of choice. I've talked about other notions of size along with Lebesgue measure, the mathematical formalization of length, on this channel in a handful of other videos, so I'm going to put some of those in the description below, and a few of them will probably pop up in cards throughout the video. However, I haven't really talked about the axiom of choice or choice functions in a, a really long time. I mean, like, since this was the chalkboard back, like, a few years ago. Um, so... With that in mind, I'm gonna start with those. So, a choice function is a function from a collection of sets to the union over that collection, such that the function maps a set from the collection to one of that set's elements. Now with that, it's natural to go ahead and ask, does every collection of sets have a choice function? And the answer to that question is only if you want it to. That's where the axiom of choice comes in. We postulate this as a fact. So the axiom of choice just says that every collection of sets has a choice function defined on that collection. Essentially, this just means that for any given set, we can pick out a particular element of that set when we want to. Now, the axiom of choice might sound straightforward, but there's actually a slew of examples of paradoxes that arise from it, which leads more than a handful of mathematicians to believe that it's not the best axiom to suppose when you're proving things. It's much stronger to prove something without using the axiom of choice than using it because then you can generalize to other logical systems like those that suppose the axiom of determinancy instead of the axiom of choice. But we're not going to go down that rabbit hole because this video is supposed to be about measure theory and not logic. So now that we've gone over what a choice function is and what the axiom of choice is, it's probably a good opportunity to give an example of what a choice function might look like. So say you have a collection of three sets, each of which contains three numbers, and you define a function called max on this collection of sets such that when you give the function max a set from this collection, it returns the largest element of that set. We can conclude that max is actually a choice function on this collection of sets because each of the outputs of max is an element of the set that it came from. So with that, we've got an example. We've sort of seen how the axiom of choice and choice functions allow us to go ahead and pick out specific elements from specific sets in collections of sets. There's one other tool that we're going to need, and that is the idea of an equivalence relation and a particular equivalence relation. So equivalence relations are just relationships that act like a quality. So they are reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. The other way to think about equivalence relations is that they partition the set they are defined on into sets of equal elements, or into what are called equivalence classes. So for the purposes of illustration, if we've got this circle that is our set and we have equivalence relation on that set, let's call it triple bar sub x, so that we're just using something that's not the double bar equal sign that we're used to, then that triple bar x breaks up our set into these different sections of the circle. Now, using the axiom of choice, we can go ahead and pick out a representative from each one of those equivalence classes. So we'll say like the top sector is going to be bracket A or the set of all things that are equivalent to A. And then the same thing for another sector, which will do bracket B and bracket C and bracket D. So in this example, the set A, B, C, D is a complete set of representatives or we'll call it a choice set for our set under this equivalence relation. So the following example of an equivalence relation is going to lead us to our paradoxical set that does not have Lebesgue measure or length as a adequate descriptor of that set. Go ahead and let x and y be real numbers. And we're going to say x is related to y with this squiggle rational symbol thing, or that x and y are rationally equivalent if the difference between x and y is a rational number. 
Now, it's very quick to see that this relationship is reflexive and symmetric because a number minus itself is zero, which is a rational number. And if you subtract two numbers and get a rational number, then when you switch the order in which you subtract them, you get the negative of that number, which also is a rational number. Transitivity takes just a little bit more work. And so I'll leave that as a short exercise if you wanna think about this more. Now, rational equivalence, just like any other equivalence relation, partitions its parent set into a collection of equivalence classes. And we'll just go ahead and look at a handful of them. So if we go ahead and look at the equivalence class A that contains one, then A is the set of all things that are rationally equivalent to one. Similarly, if we look at the square root of two, then that equivalence class is going to be the set of all things that are rationally equivalent to the square root of two, and the same thing for the cube root of pi. Now, the other thing to note is that there are a lot of different choice functions that you can define on the collection of equivalence classes here as well. So one example of a choice function might send our set A to 5 elevenths and our set B to 1 half plus the square root of 2 and our set C to the cube root of pi minus 1 ninth. If that is the case, then our choice set that corresponds to our choice function contains the elements 5 elevenths, 1 half plus the square root of 2, and the cube root of pi minus 1 ninth. So the other thing to note about choice sets that are defined on collections of equivalence classes like we have here with this rational equivalence relation is that, like in our example where you have 5 elevenths and the square root of 2 plus 1 half and the cube root of pi minus 1 ninth in our choice set, those three things along with being in the choice set, are the unique thing in the choice set from their respective equivalence classes. So because 5 elevenths is in the choice set, 1, 1 half, 2, 3,000, all of those numbers can't be in the choice set as well. And that's going to be important because that's going to be core to the following idea that's going to get us to our paradoxical set. So the claim here and the thing that we want to show is that if you've got some set of positive measure, call it E, then there exists some subset A of E that also has positive measure, is bounded, and when you go ahead and look at the choice set given by a choice function generated from the rational equivalence relation on the set A, call it C sub A, then that C sub A thing is not going to have a well-defined notion of measure or length, in other words. To start, if E has infinite measure, or in other words, is just infinitely long in a rigorous mathematical sense, then we can go ahead and look at a bounded subset of E with finite non-zero measure. So without loss of generality, we can go ahead and consider a bounded set E with finite non-zero measure. So the first thing to notice is that if you've got a rational number and you've got an element of your choice set that comes from the equivalence classes formed from rational equivalence on E, then the number from the choice set and the sum of the number from the choice set and that rational number are rationally equivalent. And since the choice set only takes in one representative of each equivalence class, that means that x plus our rational number is not going to be in our choice set. In other words, to think about this more in a physical sense is that if you go ahead and take an element of your choice set and you slide it around on the number line by a rational amount, you're never going to slide into other elements of your choice set because the two would not be rationally equivalent. Next, with this in mind, if we go ahead and let B be some bounded, countably infinite collection of rational numbers, which we can do, just go ahead and take the rational numbers and intersect it with some interval. Then for each B in B, the collection of translations of our choice set by elements of B are all disjoint sets. So when we go to measure the union over the collection of translations of our choice set, the first thing to notice is that this measurement or the length of this thing needs to be less than infinity. And we get that because both our set E and our set B are bounded. 
and we also know that our choice set is a subset of our set E, so our choice set is also bounded. The next thing to note is that because of this disjoint property for any two different Bs and B, we can change the measure of this union into a sum of those measures because we won't be double counting or measuring something twice. Once we get to the sum, we can go ahead and note that translating something does not affect its length. And so we can say that the sum of those measures is just the sum of the measure of our choice set repeated the cardinality of B times. But B is countably infinite, and thus, since the sum is bounded, it doesn't diverge to infinity. And so, since each term is just the measure of our choice set, the measure of our choice set is reportedly zero. However, instead of looking at just the rational translations by rationals that are in our set B, we can go ahead and look at what all of the rational translations of our choice set would look like. The first thing to note here is that if we translate by all possible rationals, then we will hit every other member of a given equivalence class with our representative element because we're sliding around by every choice of rational that they could be related by. And so our original set E must be a subset of this union. Since E is a subset of our union, that means that the measure of E needs to be less than or equal to the measure of this union. But we can go ahead and apply the same mathematical ideas to get that the measure of this union is actually zero. And that's a problem because we originally were given that the measure of E was positive. And thus we have a contradiction. But yeah, that essentially finishes the proof of this statement, which is usually formatted a little bit differently and stated as Vitale's theorem, which says that any positive measure subset of the real numbers has a subset that is non-measurable, or in other words, has a subset where the mathematical formalization of length doesn't make sense as a descriptor for that set. Essentially, these choice sets have illustrated the idea in the title of this video, but the core thing to note about them is that they exist because we use the axiom of choice. The axiom of choice was core to being able to construct them and form the argument around their existence. The reason I'm talking about all this stuff uh, was mostly because I wanted to talk about a cool function and how it interacts with measurability. In order to do that, I needed to prove this first so I can reference back to it when I talk about that function in the next, vid the next chalkboard video. Not the next video. The next video is probably going to be an update because grades come out on Wednesday or probably when this video gets posted. Um, so I'll be doing an update about how PhD stuff is going. But otherwise, that's essentially all I had for you today. So anyway, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics stuff that I put out here on the internet. Uh, as always, I am Nathan. This was Chalk, and I will see you next time. Bye.